Now that we've looked at the aggregate supply in the matching model with heterogeneous agents, we can look at the aggregate demand. Um, so to do that, we have to uh, aggregate all the um, you know, individual behaviors, behavior of each household. So let's do that. So what we had seen is that um, for household I, uh, household I is going to purchase uh, YI, so that's the amount of services that would be purchased, and that we said was going to be sigma X, where sigma X is going to be the marginal propensity to spend. Uh, and it depends on uh, the market tightness out of uh, household I, uh, initial wealth and income. Income is F of X times KI. So that's how much you sell of the KI services as a household that you brought to the market. Plus initial wealth, which is mu I divided by P, the price level. And um, just as a reference, sigma X, we said was equal to key, the preference parameter, epsilon one plus tau x, one minus epsilon. So this is something that we showed earlier, and that's just for reference, I'm repeating it here, one plus key epsilon, one plus tau x, one minus epsilon, and that's, uh, Sigma X is the uh, marginal propensity to spend. And that's between zero and one. Okay, so household I purchases this much. Um, okay, and so then once we aggregate, uh, the total amount of um, services purchased. So once we aggregate uh, over all household to get uh, the concept of aggregate demand, so it's going to be Y. So of course, total amount purchased is a sum over all household of the amount of services that they each want to purchase, sum of the YI. Um, and so here we can take the sigma x out because the marginal propensity to spend are the same across all uh, household uh, times f of x is going to be the same sum of the k over i plus the sum of all household of the u i over p. Okay, uh, so this we can simplify a little bit. Sigma x marginal propensity to uh, spend is the same everywhere times uh, f of x, the sum of all the capacities ki we denote it by k, the sum of the mu i is the endowment of uh, money or wealth we denote it by mu, and we've got that divided by p. And so finally, so what we have, and here what we recognize. Uh, here, f of x k, you recognize that the um, amount of services that are sold when tightness is uh, x, and that's what we had denoted as the aggregate, um, as the aggregate supply curve. That's just y s of x. Um, so, so we can rewrite output y as sigma x times y s of x plus mu over p. Okay, so that's a key result here. Um, this is the amount of output that's going to be purchased by household when they maximize their utility um, subject to their budget constraint, but in a world in which you have wealth and income inequality. Um, And here something is very important that's going to pop up. Uh, conceptually, something that's very important.
So what you notice here is that the Y that we have here, uh, this output, that's basically, um, you know, aggregate. It's the aggregate um, quantity of um, services demanded. And what we notice here is that's key is that this quantity depends on the aggregate supply here. Okay, and so here we we find a, fl a flavor of the very famous uh, says law. Um, so says law, it's a very old law in economics that di dates from the 19th century. It's named after um, Jean Baptiste Say. And says law is that is this idea that supply uh, create its own demand, and it's the idea that if you have some supply, basically, if you have some income, you're going to spend a lot of it, and that's going to create uh, that's going to create demand. Now, says law is saying that supply creates its own demand. So whatever the supply is, that's going to be demanded. Okay, uh, and that would be true in a kind of standard um, in a standard model. And of course, when you have when you have says law, you cannot have uh, you cannot have a proper concept of aggregate demand. Um, so that's that's an important kind of insight when you build model. When you build models, is that uh, when uh, says law holds, you cannot have uh, a proper of uh, no proper concept of aggregate demand. And that's something that a lot of people uh, maybe do not realize. Um, now, of course, it's not something that's new here. And that's something that, you know, uh, micro theorists have been aware of for a very long time, but um, it's something that's also sometimes a bit under the radar and that people don't really uh, realize more generally. Um, but nevertheless, so when it says law, uh, holds you're not going to have a proper concept of aggregate demand because any supply would be its own demand. Uh, so here we have a, a, a flavor of says law, but you notice that says law is actually broken here in the model, that it doesn't hold in the sense that the aggregate demand is not equal to the aggregate supply because sigma x is strictly less than one here. And because sigma is strictly less than one, you can see that the aggregate supply is not going to translate directly into aggregate demand. It's less than that. Uh, it's only a fraction of the aggregate supply that will become uh, aggregate demand. So, uh, so this is key. So because Sigma is strictly less than one, says law uh, is broken here. Uh, that is, uh, supply is not going to create its own demand entirely. In fact, any amount of supply, there is only a fraction sigma that becomes demand. Uh, so only a fraction sigma less than one of supply becomes demand. Um, and as a result, we will be able to have a proper concept of aggregate demand. Okay, so here, because we have this sigma less than one, because we have a marginal propensity to spend that's less than one, our sales law is broken. So this was this sigma here that we have. Uh, that's a mar that's uh, you know the marginal propensity to spend, uh, and so because it's strictly less than one, 
not all supply will become demand, we can have a proper concept of aggregate demand. Okay, so that's something that's very key and that appears nicely here. So uh, we have a, some flavor, says law operates at some partial level that supply gives some of the demand, but not one to one. So And so as a result, we'll be able to have some aggregate demand here. And so the question is, um, what's the ingredient that we've put in the model that actually broke says law? And that's very important because uh, once you realize what is this ingredient, you can also use it in other models, to, to in any model in which you want to create an aggregate demand. When you don't have it, you won't be able to actually have a proper non-degenerate aggregate demand. Um, so why is says row broken? Well, uh, so mechanically, it's because uh, sigma is strictly less than one. And so now economically, why is sigma strictly less than one? Well. We can look at the expression for sigma that we have here, and we see that what's key to have something that's strictly less than one um, is that we have a parameter key here and a parameter key here that um, um, yes, that's going to be finite. Um, so you see, if key was infinite here, sigma would be one. But as soon as key is um, finite, then uh, then sigma is strictly less than one. So mathematically, that's what's going on here. So because sigma is strictly less than one, which is um, because key is strictly less than infinity, so key is finite. Indeed, if key was infinite, sigma would be one. And so what does that mean that key is finite? Well, if we go back to uh, key is a uh, parameter from the utility function, if we go back to the utility function, the fact that key is finite means that household put a positive weight on uh, real wealth. And so economically what's going on here, key, key finite means this is because, which is because uh, real wealth enter the utility function. And so you recall the utility function took this form. U the C M was um, key over one plus key C epsilon minus one minus one plus one over one plus key m over p epsilon and so you recall this was the expression and so if key is uh, infinite then this the coefficient in front of uh, c becomes one and this one the coefficient in front of real wealth is equal to zero if key is infinite. And so the fact that key is finite means that real wealth enters the utility function. And so it's because real wealth enters the utility function that we have a marginal propensity to spend that's less than one, and that's why we break says low, and that's why we get an aggregate demand. So that's very important. Um, so intuitively, what we need to uh, to break says law is that we need that households value something else than consumption. They must have the choice between spending their initial wealth and their income on something else than consumption. And here, they have that choice. They can decide to, instead of spending all their income and initial wealth on consumption, what they can do is they can uh, just store it as a uh, saving. Okay? And the fact that they value this saving uh, is going to create, uh, is, is going to break says law here. Um, this is something, for instance, in uh, Blanchard and Kiyotaki, uh, in Blanchard and Kiyotaki's famous uh, 1987 paper, that's something that they also make very clear that they introduce, uh, exactly as we do here, they introduce real money balances into the utility function as a way to break says law, as a way to allow people 
to uh, value something else than consumption. Um, So household will value something something else than consumption. Here it's a real wealth that they value. Okay, so here it appears very cl clearly that's what you need to have, uh, have your marginal propensity to save below. Okay, so here we have our expression. So now, um, now, let, let's try to uh, compare the expression for the aggregate demand with the one we had uh, when we had representative agent. So this is the expression we have. So let's, uh, and what we see is that it's not exactly the same as what we had when we had a representative agent, um, because here we've been going a little bit more. So it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a different expression, it has nothing to do with heterogeneity. Um, it's just that here we've been going a, a bit more slowly over the derivation. And in particular, we haven't used the fact that um, all income is also going to be, uh, that all income, you know, uh, Ys of X, the great supply, is going to also be an expenditure. Um, because in a sense that's already using the you know the equilibrium con the condition that we use to solve the model that supply is equal to demand. So once you go a bit more slowly, that's when you notice like that you have this flavor of says law and that says law is broken. Um, but so here this equation here is a little bit different from the one we had uh, earlier. But how do we recover what we had earlier? Because what we had earlier was um, correct. It's just that we had gone a bit fast and. We had done exactly uh, isolated this marginal propensity to spend uh, out of supply. Um, but how do we go back to what we to what we have uh, to what we had earlier? So So in the model, we are going to have then, um, we have two expressions for output that come from the fact that you can look at it from two different uh, angles. And once we do that, we'll be able to uh, to recover the old expression for aggregate demand. Um, but um, before that, let me just notice that. So here, what do we have? So here, um, So here from the aggregate demand analysis, what we found is that uh, y, the, uh, the output, is equal to sigma x, the marginal propensity to spend, times the supply, aggregate supply, which is the income of all household, plus mu over p, which is the endowment of real wealth. And here what's tricky is that uh, y s of x, at the marginal propensity to spend, and that's uh, that's decreasing with tightness, as we established earlier. F uh, y s of x, that's the aggregate supply, that's increasing. With tightness. So here, you know, when the market is tighter, people are able to sell more services. Uh, that's the aggregate supply, which is also uh, it's also household real income. So the real income is increasing with tightness. When market is tighter, you can sell more things. But at the same time, uh, when tight, the market is tighter, you your marginal propensity to spend is falling, so you, you spend a smaller fraction of your income. And so here you have these two forces that move in opposite direction. And so it's hard to know how output as given by this, you know, by this function 
is responding to tightness. You know, this, this, the function of tightness yx times uh, sigma x and ys of x plus mu over p. We, you know, it's not obvious to see whether it's going to be increasing or decreasing in tightness. And so we need to um, we need to think about the model more globally to move a little bit our, uh, the key relationship in the model and to be able to figure out uh, whether you know, the, the proper concept of aggregate demand would be increasing or decreasing with tightness. Here, we're a little bit stuck as we are. Um, and so we have to we have to collect our thoughts a little bit to be able to reshuffle things and, you know, write aggregate demand actually as a decreasing function of, uh, of tightness. Because here we can see that there are two opposing forces.